Well, hello and welcome to Trading Blows from TraderX. Another busy show this week. Plenty for us and the panel to get our teeth into. We'll have a look at what may cause cross-asset volatility to make a comeback. We saw some glimmers of life coming back into the market yesterday, so we'll look into whether that can continue. We'll also discuss whether traders should worry about the debt ceiling debacle that's taking place in the United States. We'll have a look at uh, UEDA's first decision over the bank over at the Bank of Japan, and also examine whether risks may tilt in terms of the global growth outlook. Without further Further ado, let's get into the show. So as always, a packed agenda of talking points for us to get through. Let's meet our panelists. As always, going head to head over four rounds, they'll score points for a great response, and of course, have the threat of points being chalked off looming over them if a dispute is raised over their answer or their fashion choices. Of course, the better the response, the more points that they score. Um, joining us this week, Arno Venter, market analyst in the worst shirt that he could find. Uh, also, Ryan Cozy <laughs> in the famous yellow Guinness plain hoodie, the founder of PIQ Suite, who. I must say, launched their new website slash platform this week, and it is looking very, very slick indeed. So if you haven't checked that out, then please do so. If you if you don't check it out, then you are missing out at the end of the day. Um, and last, but by no, no means least, Adam Linton, head of the European desk at New Squawks, a provider of real-time audio headlines and analysis who have been invaluable over the last few weeks over earnings season, and I'm sure will continue to be so um, as we move into what's looking like a, a very, very busy week on the macro front next week as well. With all of that said and done, let's get into the first round. So I want to start by discussing volatility. Arno, I want to come to you first of all. We saw a little bit of uh, excitement back into the market on uh, well Tuesday with the, the big move lower in the S&P. I think it was the worst day since the 22nd of March and the Nasdaq having its worst day since the, the 9th of March. Although having said that, if you look at implied measures of volatility, they do remain relatively subdued. The VIX is still comfortably below 20. The, the move index is at its lowest since uh, late February. And implied volatility across the, the G10FX space is relatively low as well. So what do you think might breathe a bit of life back into markets? And do you think the, the excitement that we saw yesterday might be set to continue? Yeah, well, I mean, if you if you look at why vol is, has been compressed so much, you know, if you there's a lot of smarter people out there in terms of the option space that's obviously provided a lot of information on why we've seen this compression. But for a non-option expert um, like me, I think it's just sentiment positioning that's that's explaining a lot of the moves that we've had. I mean, six weeks ago, the markets thought that we were headed for a new banking crisis. And now, you know, five weeks later, they're not thinking that anymore. Obviously, we've had some hiccups with S um, uh, FRC over the, uh, over the day or so, but... Right. Can I just say, like, by the time this comes out, that we might be back in one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so for, for now, it looks like we've, uh, we've ever right had a, a banking crisis. Um, apart from that, six weeks ago, the market thought the Fed would be hiking rates to, what, 5.6%. Now they think they're going to cut. So I think those two things alone explains a lot of the vol compression that we've had over the course of the last few weeks. We've also had the economic data, which haven't really given us a clear view of where we're going. Um, what I mean by that is I think the aggregative information is still pointing to a slowdown, but we've had some uh, hiccups in terms of data points showing us really positive data as well, like the flash PMIs we had on Friday. So I think the fact that we've had both good and bad data um, just means the markets, th there's uncertainty, but it's not to the extent of, oh man, we're going to fall off a cliff uncertainty. It's just like, okay, we're waiting. We're waiting and watching to see what's going to happen. So I think a lot of that explains a lot of that volatility suppression that we've had. Um, I think the one that's been most surprising has been on the ethics space, actually, because I can understand equity volatility, but I mean, implied vols on the ethics space have really drifted lower over the course of the last, let's just call it two and three weeks. That's been, that's been a bit of a surprise for me. And I understand why, because the dollar has been pushing lower. And it seems like the consensus of the markets right now is that the dollar will continue to fall. And that should see implied vols coming down. But it's weird that if you consider the week that we're going to have next week, which we'll touch on in a second, I think if you consider that, it doesn't make a lot of sense that uh, FX implied vols is this low right now. I think that's a little bit of a risk where the markets might be pricing uh, volatility a little bit too cheap going into next week. And then in terms of what could create some volatility, I mean, we had obviously Google and Microsoft out overnight. That didn't really create a lot of 
upside despite solid earnings that we've had. We also had positive guidance, especially the markets got very excited about the, uh, the, uh, the, the AI plans for the two companies. That didn't really move the needle, which was interesting. Um, obviously, it comes back to First Republic Bank that has created a bit of, of negativity in the markets. But you know, obviously, this week, we've got GDP. Um, I know everybody always gets excited about GDP, but I, I hate GDP as an indicator. It's like, you know, it's, it's about being reminded of somebody that bought you a beer, you know, a year back. It doesn't matter. I want somebody to buy me one today. It's the data, equivalent. It's the data <laughs> equivalent of Fed minutes. Yes, exactly. It's just, it's a silly, silly print, but the markets will be paying attention. So we have to pay attention. If that comes in considerably above or below estimates, that, that can create some volatility for sure, especially with the markets right now still leaning more towards a soft landing, which I don't think is the case. But we've got GDP now, I think at two, I've got it just somewhere at two spot 5% for Atlanta Fed. So anything considerably above or below that can spark some volatility. On Friday, we've got the employment cost index, which I think will be interesting this week because labor data, I think on the growth side, which we'll touch on later, is where we need to put our focus right now on, on, um, on labor and earnings. But next week, next week is going to be a gauntlet when it comes to economic data. I mean, we've got the two ISM prints on Monday and Wednesday. We've got flash HICP for Eurozone on Tuesday. Okay, but regional data on Friday will give us an idea of where that's going to land anyway with Germany. France and I think Spain uh, regional data coming up on Friday. And then next week, we've got FMC, we've got ECB, we have the China Kaijin PMIs coming up, uh, and of course, closing it out with NFP. So all of that can really, really create a lot of volatility. I think what we've seen right now has been a weirdly quiet period, but looking at next week, I, I, I would be surprised if next week we aren't considerably higher in terms of uh, implied vol measures. Well, fingers crossed, because I think everyone is starting to get a little bit sick and tired of the, the low volatility that we see. Um, as you say, it has been a strange couple of weeks. I do wonder whether there's any correlation between Ryan's absence from this show um, and the lack of movement that we're seeing. Um, Ryan, what do you make of what's going on or what um, isn't going well, on more firstly, accurately? I think, as always, an absolute masterclass from the boy Arno. I was like, you know, can he take my turn as well? Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I, don't, I think he's exactly right in what he's saying. Um, you know, I think it's very easy for people to get, well, we see it every day, you know, if, if you're on social media or whatever, if you're following the pundits, people get so frothy over a little move in the VIX and what, you know, what have you. I think people need to take a step back and, um, and realise anything below sub-20 in the VIX is, you know, we're not in trouble or anything like this. And, you know, people, I think there's not, you know, as we all know, there's a lot of things that annoy me about people in general, but um, no. right up there is the older uh, volatility tourists that kind of coming, you know, like, you know, when we saw volatility recently kind of going through the floor and stuff, you know, everyone said, oh, it's, you know, it's too low, it's going to spike high. No one has it. Like, these people don't have it. As Arno pointed out at the very start, um, you know, there's some very smart people that you can follow and kind of that give away a lot of, you know, good information that are options and volatility experts. So try and kind of dig those out if you can. But in terms of in terms of what I would suggest, and again, I am by far the worst person you want to talk to regarding volatility, but at least I know that. So I'm not going to give myself more than anything else. But, you know, there's, there's that whole thing, of, you know, fade hyperbole wear diamonds, which kind of will always pay off. Um, in terms of um, things on the um, kind of the outlook, should we say, that, um, that could kind of throw a spanner in the works. Um, again, as Arno said, next week, it's uh, going to be a crazy one. Um, something that I think, I don't know how, I don't know if this is the the best subject, the best topic of today's discussion to bring it up in, but it, I do kind of think it has a link to it. Um, you've seen as the volatility has dropped over the last week or so, the the rise in um, the de-dollarization commentary has gone through the roof. And obviously we've got the BRICS kind of coming through as well, Argentina, Brazil, well, Brazil and that kind of at Lula um earlier on today announcing that maybe they might let's do something x volatility as uh, x dollar um i think that is adding to a little bit of kind of some nerves but nerves from the wrong people yeah okay people are going to start throwing stats at you like the you know dollar share of global reserves fall into the lowest level since 1995 but that's you know it's basically been doing that every year for a long time period of time and it's still extremely high percentage so you know that's just a very slow trend but it makes a good headline every time it hits a new percentage lower um in terms of um you know the in terms of what to do next 
again, I don't. I think you've just got to sit on your hands until next week, and you know. And if and do you know what? If markets are really quiet, so what? You know, this is a great time for people to learn that patience is the biggest virtue in trading. Well, that and discipline. So, you know, I would imp- I would use this as an opportunity to, you know, brush up on your discipline and brush up on your patience, and do not be forced into trading for no reason. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think that's a, a really, really great point. I saw, I think it was Monday, and I can't remember who it was now. If, if someone does know, then, then please jump in. But a, a post of someone's trading journal on Twitter, um, and they basically said, you know, I haven't done anything today. All of these various ideas, no ideas, no movement. I haven't done anything. Yes, I think it yeah. was. Yes, that's right. Um, and I just thought that's a really valuable lesson in actually sometimes Absolutely. the best thing to do is just to work from the desk. You know, I think it was that that prompted me to think about it. So, yeah, 100%. And again, I think that's something, yeah, maybe I'll give him a, sh- give him a shout out when we put this out because he's a great person to follow for just for a level-headed view. Yeah, most certainly. Um, Adam, let's bring you into the show. As, as Arno said, it's uh, it's a busy week looking ahead to the next kind of six or seven days. Obviously, we're going to talk about the Bank of Japan later, but looking into next week, out of all Arno mentioned, what, what do you think is the real meaty event that we should be focusing on the most? Uh, yeah, so, you know, I might be a little bit contrarian here. I don't think next week's actually going to be that incremental for the market. I think, oh, you, take, I think you take the big... <laughs> Uh, three events next week. I think you say the FOMC. I think we know they're going to do 25 basis points. They've got, you know, the big thing for the Fed is will they pause in June? Well, they've got another two inflation reports before then. So I don't think at this stage they're going to be recommitting really about what comes further down the line. Um, I think for the ECB, I think the market's priced 75% for 25 basis points and then 25 basis points, 75% for 50 basis points. We got the inflation data and we got the bank lending survey, um, which could potentially guide that decision. But I think we know with ECB it'll be a political one, and we'll get twenty five because and we'll and we'll get further hikes going forward. I think for the ECB, the question is kind of the stickiness of inflation and what their policy response to that is. And again, I don't think that's anything we're really going to see resolved next week. Yes, the bank lending survey. I think that will potentially be interesting. Because that's when we actually kind of see the real economy effect, uh, real economy effect of kind of what's going on in the eurozone. I think we like to get quite obsessed with kind of inflation, PMI's GDP, but you know the bank lending survey will give you more of a flavour for the actual transmit transmission mechanism, which the ECB are kind of obviously in charge of. So that could actually be one to watch. But I think a lot of the questions we have aren't really going to get resolved next week. I think of the three events, I think it's possible NFP could potentially be the most important one, because I think that could act as kind of a guide to kind of cement people's biases ahead of what's to come later from the Fed, i.e. if we have a really strong release, well, does that put June back on the table? If things are beginning to soften, then okay, that's it, we could be done. And then but ultimately, I think, you know, I've, I've said this in kind of previous episodes before, for me, I think the real crunch point for markets is a H2 story, not a H1 story. You know, I said, la- I said last week that the real disconnect in the market at the moment is with the Fed. And, you know, the Fed's talking tough that they're going to, you know, hold rates at their, their kind of terminal for a little while. Market hasn't really been buying that yet. I don't think there's going to be too much, you know, there's been things at the margin that we'll see which will kind of influence that debate. But I think, you know, it's very much a second half of the year story and kind of who blinks first. So yes, I think, you know, there will be stuff that will kind of help people with their framework. But I think by the time we kind of sit back next Friday, I think, you know, our expectations of like this potential big vol week may, you know, be underwhelmed somewhat. Um, so can I, what, what's everyone's thinking on the Fed then? Because obviously, uh, well, obviously market's pricing in 76% chance well, on the CME's Fed watch right now of a hike 25. Adam, you kind of agreed with that, right? Hike 25. Yeah, I, yeah I, th- I think it's. I think you know the Fed just you doesn't really have right. history. Doesn't have a history of standing in the way of market pricing. Yeah, no, I, I, I completely agree on that. So, Arno, Mike, what do you think? Uh, yeah, I think twenty five, and then that's probably it for the cycle. I, I, I love market pricing. I think market pricing is increasingly accurate because, if anything, the Fed don't want to mess that up either. Um, however, for the first time in a long time. I'm slightly thinking we could get a surprise. And I never normally back a surprise. You know me, I love fading 
be exotic. But I'm starting to think we might get surprised. At the very least, I think we might get a very dovish hiked move high. So sorry, just in terms of surprise, you mean a surprise hole rather than a surprise? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We're definitely not hiking 50. Sorry, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. Jesus Christ. Well, for sake, mate, what do you, what do you, what, what's leaning you in that um, I just think is that, is that a base case or just like a more of a strong outside chance? Sorry. No, I, I just, I would say it's, I, yeah. So I, I reckon, obviously, you can't, you'd be stupid to go against market pricing, right? 76% chance, right? However, I do believe that if we if we haven't had a surprise in a long time, not that that means we're due one. However, I do think it's a lot closer than 75-25. I would make it more 60-40. Um, and if we do get if we if we do get the height 25, I believe it'll be a dovish height 25. Um, and the reason for that being, yeah, you know, we're seeing yeah you know, this whole lag of you know central uh, bank policy lags through into the economy. So that lag is slowly picking up. Also, we're seeing some growth slowing. Like we've just had core capital goods come out that was a, a drop in March. Yeah, we've also had a, you know this second round effect of banks in trouble. I'm not going to use the word crisis because that's hyperbolic. Um, but you know, I just I think if the if the Fed were ever going to come and lowball e like expectations, um, I think this would be the one. And if we do get a high 25, I think, as I said, I think, it, or, or was it Michael that said it'd be like one and done? This, this could be the last one we see for uh, for at least a hold period. Mm. No, That's good stuff. Opinion. Well, interesting perspective. We'll wait until next Wednesday to see if Ryan is. Oh, yeah, high right. 50, here we come. <laughs> 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 Typical. Um, we are going to stick in the US with uh, the second round of the show. Then. So we'll obviously see what the Fed do uh, next Wednesday, but I guess one of the bigger issues at play in the US at the moment, and certainly one that's starting to get increasing attention in the media, is the issue of the debt ceiling. We seem to be getting closer and closer to the X date. Ryan's emotion sums up everyone's emotion, I think, when it comes to this this uh, issue. It's a perennial thing every now and again. The debt ceiling comes around. We all know it's going to be solved. It's just a question of how close do we get to that X date, I think, um, and the potential impact it could have on the market. Um, Ryan, go on. I can see you're itching to get your teeth into Oh, mate. Oh, um, hold me back. <laughs> is this just going to be a case of, like it is every time, there's an agreement and we all move on? Or do you think that Obviously, we know the US isn't going to default, but do you think this is going to have a, a bit more of an impact on the market than perhaps our, our exasperation would suggest? First off, I, um, I'm going to open up my P PIQ merchandise store and we're going to be selling T-shirts that say, I survived the debt ceiling crisis of <laughs> 2000, 2001, 2002, 2003, and all I got was this lousy T-shirt. It's the same thing know? over and over. Guys, Your get a grip. T-shirt wouldn't be big enough to fit all the years on. Well, this is what well, could go around the back, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> but um, yeah, it's kind of, yeah, you, it kind of shows, I think it's when this kind of comes around and it does come around every um, it's a good kind of litmus test to find one, people that are kind of new to the markets and two, people that are trying to sell something or just trying to stay relevant because everyone knows that it's going to be fixed. Also, stop looking at it as purely an economic issue or like, topic it's not it's more political now than ever the reason why this is slightly this time feel well according to some feels a bit more you know or nervy the only reason for that is biden is just announcing his presidency as as his um decision to run next time this is full politics now you know we know both parties will agree some kind of it won't be a you know it won't be a it won't be a full solution it'll be kicking the can again but th to them that is a solution so nor all this absolute bollocks about you know oh it's different this time if i had a quid for every time someone said it was different i'd have more money than i did making like more money than i did when i was trading which isn't hard obviously um <laughs> but, uh, i'll make the jokes um but yeah it's you know yellen's obviously getting a bit um you know a lot of flack um from the republicans but rightfully so yeah you know it's, it's, that's politics for you there's been a lot of talk recently about us cds is blowing out and all that stuff it's gone to what 60 from 59 in a week yeah you know, it's something like something ridiculous like that it's like what are you talking about it's like me saying you know i'm, I'm coming one day and i'm a lot taller and i've grown an inch you know so i'm now five foot eight a big deal well it's not unfortunately selling yeah. the five foot eight 
well, well, no, I will if I gained an inch, though, wouldn't I? You know, <laughs> um, yeah, so I don't believe the hype. It might add a bit of volatility, going back to what we said before, into the markets. But, you know, you will see some some substantial hedging trades being mentioned in Bloomberg and whatever like that. But these are out the money options that nominal value are very small, but they're, you know, they make headlines because they're big trades. And of course, if you've got like yards and yards under management, you're going to risk, you're going to hedge trades, right? You're going to hedge your positions with big lumpy trades. Do not get fooled into thinking that that means people are betting on a default or it not being happened. It's not, it's insure. it's extremely cheap insurance. And I wish people would know more about the fact that when a big options trade is mentioned or something like that, half the time, the nominal values are tiny. Like Zero Hedge are the best for doing that. Oh, so and so, 50,000 lots of yeah, out the money, you know, calls have gone through. Yeah, but nominal values about what I, you know, what you spend on a decent sandwich lunch. It's, it's, it's part of the game. As you can see, I'm very emotive about this. Um <laughs> If, if you did want to have some kind of default, you know, some default risk or whatever, or you, you do believe that this time it's different and I'm wrong, which, you know, quite possibly I am. I often am. Um, you know, you've got your safe havens. Your traditional ones are probably the only ones that are going to be worth any value, which is like yen and gold, um, which, yeah, I know we're talking about the um, Bank of Japan next. Maybe I won't go into too much about that. But, yeah, I guess it comes back to fading the hyperbolic nonsense that we mentioned before. Um, that's pretty it's always a good one. strategy, that. Always oh, it's, That's it's, always it's, a winning trade. We, we joke. We we I know we do joke about it, but fading the Hollywood ending in markets in life in general is always a winner. You're gonna win more times than you lose, and that's all that matters. Yeah. Anyway, there we go. Absolutely. Um <laughs> Adam, what are your thoughts on this whole debacle, particularly in terms of the, the growth side of things? Is is this gonna be a, another headwind to the economy, which is already on shaky ground, or do you think everyone can just kind of safely ignore it and will plod along okay regardless? Yeah, so you know, I mean, adding to kind of what Brian said, I think this is kind of like it's almost becomes like a little bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy. People get themselves worked up so much about it. There's so many column inches developed, you know, dedicated to it. And this is one of those unfortunate scenarios where you kind of see politics meet financial markets and you kind of kind of no real expert in both. And they kind of shouting over each other that this is, you know, the end of the world. Like it, yeah, exactly. <laughs> but, yeah. Um, you know, if it, if it was purely an economic issue and there were the politics were taken out of it, I, th I think it'd be even less of an issue than it already is. I think, you know, I don't know how it necessarily gets solved. I think, you know, at the moment Biden isn't talking to Republicans. Maybe if he gives some ground on that front and he can maybe spin it into he's the guy that avoided the debt ceiling or he can kind of lean on the Republicans knowing they don't have too much uh, sway in the House and then maybe make some concessions on spending. Yes, that is a potential way forward. But, you know, as in terms of the broader tape, as you, you know, the products that you're talking about, they're very niche things. You know, these are very specific parts of the market. Um, and in terms of the broader tape, you know, we care about we care about monetary policy and we care about earnings season, the things that we've already been talking about. And then, yes, nearer to the time we may get, you know, depending on what else is going on in the world, we may get some, you know, more jitters about it. But ultimately, it's something I think will be resolved. But I think the actual, if you know, if you're looking at sort of markets point, I think you should actually be looking at if you assume it does get solved okay, what does it take to get it solved? And does this, you know, ultimately alter the fiscal backdrop? Because, you know, the big wrangling at the moment is over the spending. So if you take that as kind of given, then what does it actually do to the kind of the fiscal outlook in the US? There's a good piece by John Authors, and he kind of noted in 2011, all of the year-to-date gains for the S&P 500 were wiped out after an agreement was reached because it took $2 trillion dollars of spending cuts, which is a lot more than people had been anticipating. So therefore, if we kind of, you know, we know the Republicans, they want to cut down on spending, they want to water down the Inflation Reduction Act. So if we kind of get that this time, and, you know, a lot of our conversations have centered around, you know, the economic slowdown that we're currently getting, does this exacerbate it? Or alternatively, does, you know, the Fed need to step in and, you know, maybe meet the market expectations of rate cuts in Q4, Q3? I think, you know, if you assume, yeah, if you assume that the debt scene will get sold, you know, don't just stop there. I think, you know, the actual potential move could be, you know, what, you know, what happens when the dust settles and what that fiscal backdrop's like. I think that's a really good point. And I think actually that's 
you know, the, probably the most important takeaway from this, because if you do see fiscal policy tighten up significantly, then that is obviously a big downside risk to growth. And the whole, you know, debt ceiling won't be raised, things are going to collapse is great for people who've been short the S&P since 1500 on a paper trading account and can brag about it on the internet. But, well, Colin, uh, I'm getting a point for that because you're stealing my line. Yeah, I hope you didn't notice that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, for anyone else, it's it's hope it's it's hopeless, and you do need to look at those longer term implications. Arno, are you on board with that? Are you thinking that actually it's what could come in the second half of the year when when we get the fallout from this debate that that could really be the driver of markets when it comes to the debt limit? Yeah, mate. No, I don't think so. I mean, you know what? My my first thing, my first <laughs> question about the debt ceiling is. <laughs> Are we seriously doing all of this crap again? You know, I mean, it happens. It happens every single time, regardless of who's in control, whether it's the Dems or the Republicans. It's always a fight. Uh, the Dems will blame the Republicans. The Republicans will blame the Dems. The only thing we are 100 percent sure of right now is that when it is resolved, both parties will claim will claim victory. Right? The one will say it's us. We made it work. The other one will say, well. We had to compromise for the sake of whatever. You know, it's just a bunch of nonsense. Um, I mean, it's like the markets have amnesia every single time that the debt ceiling debate pops up. You know, weren't you around the last 10 times that this happened type of thing? You know, it, it happened so many times you would think they would just let it go. But we know that's not how the game works, right? Like Ryan said, people have very big vested interests in the markets in specific very niche uh, um markets like Adam said as well. So they do need to hedge. They do need to make sure that they are protected. You don't want to be the guy that for the for the tenth time that maybe we do see something bad happens, you can't be the guy that hasn't uh, uh, protected your downside. You, you, need, you do need to make sure that you're protecting yourself. So I think that's what that's why we're seeing some of these distortions in uh, the things like the bill yields and the spreads. I think that's just really people that they have to do it. It's not like it's not. It's like Ryan said. It's not like they think it's not gonna. You know, we 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 might not get the ceiling um, up again. It's basically just them saying, "Listen, I have to go through this. I have to play through this circus until it's sorted out." Um, in terms of dates, I think where it can get a little bit more interesting for the markets. In terms of dates, I read that Barclays puts the the X date, I think, somewhere at the end of July. Now, for those of you watching who don't know what the X date is, that's just a fancy way of saying that's the date when Treasury will basically run out of their money, right? So the X date is right now seen as somewhere uh, at the end of July. I think Barclays said they, uh, Treasury will get something like 140 billion um, at the end of the month, which will allow them to push it into July. So the good news for the markets is that there's time for all of this to play out. The bad news is that we'll need to sit through all of this crap for the next few weeks with all of the political showboating. Um, should the markets be concerned? I really wish that they weren't, but again, they need to hedge. So we're going to see a little bit of volatility maybe picking up. Um, you know, the thing about politicians, they are arrogant and petty enough to let the US default, but hopefully it's all just a show like usual and, and hopefully it doesn't play out that way. I think where it becomes more interesting for the markets, and this is where it can, you know, have a bigger impact, um, is with what the Treasury has had to do with the debt ceiling running closer. They've obviously drawn down that Treasury general account quite massively. And normally when that happens, the market sees that as a little bit of a of a liquidity injection. So that's also provided some ample liquidity. The concern is that let's say the situation is resolved and we do see them needing to fill back up, then that can obviously be seen as a big drag on liquidity. And you, you guys know it's like the tide, right? Uh, the moment when that liquidity gets uh, uh, pulled out of the system or drained, that's going to pose a risk. Now, latching on to what Adam said here is that for me, it's not a problem now. It's a problem with when it's resolved at the end of July or whenever it's going to come down to the wire. We know that they like to, you know, over dramatize everything. So it, it's going to come down to the wire. That means that after July, going into once again, the second half of the year, when they need to then remove liquidity and then you know, in my expectations, I think that's when the economy really starts to show some signs of jitters, when some of those previous hikes starts making its way into the system. So you could end up with such a bad situation in the second half where you have growth slowing more, the labor market catching up to that, and then Treasury having to drain that liquidity. So I do think there is risks coming out of this, but 
not because they, you know, the ceiling won't be sorted. It's because of what Treasury has had to do and what they will need to do after this is sorted. I think that's where the risks for the markets lie. But in terms of them, you know, sorting this out, I mean, I can't believe we're here again, really. It's, it's well, also worth yeah. noting with the uh, with the X date thing as well. People shouldn't get too intimidated by it. That's just when they won't be able to fund all of their obligations. So at that point, they're just going to start prioritizing anyway. They might delay paying some contractors. It's not like, oh my God, the US is bankrupt. I think the X date, you know, <laughs> this X date is kind of just, you know, like sales sales material for like, the doomsayers. It's, 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 it, what, it's, yeah. it's, uh, if, all you need to do is watch a few episodes of The West Wing and you understand how much bollocks this is about. <laughs> the West, the, I've learned more from The West Wing about American politics than anything else. You can tell what Ryan's watching on his Netflix account at the moment. Succession um, at the moment, mate. Succession. <laughs> uh, well, let's move on to the second half of the show with that said and done. So I want to get over to Japan. Uh, it's going to be an interesting one on Friday. Not interesting enough for me to get up at 4 a.m. to work out what's going on, but it will be interesting nonetheless to see Ueda's first decision over at the Bank of Japan. Um, market surprising, pretty much no chance of anything happening. But I think things start to get a little bit more interesting when we look to, to June and then beyond that as well, with um, increasing numbers of, of voices on the sell side starting to talk about um, June being the time when the BOJ start to hint at talking about, thinking about possibly maybe perhaps easing uh, or tightening <laughs> things up after decades of ultra-loose policy. Um, while Ryan chokes there, uh, Adam, what should we be looking right. for uh, out of the BOJ on, on Friday and, and also over the next sort of three or four months? Friday, short answer, not a lot. <laughs> and on to the next question. Yeah, uh, you know, I mean, look, we all know, B o, you know, BOJ governor, ex BOJ governor Croda, he was there for a very, very long time, and the mantra is very much ultra loose, easy policy. And when you make changes, they're only at the margin. Obviously, we saw that, you know, surprise in December. That was more kind of a technical adjustment rather than like a wholesale policy shift. And then since then. You know, any of the market expectations that had been there for further tightening have been disappointed. So if you're the new, you know, the new boy at the BOJ, are you going to rock the market on your first meeting? No, because that's just not how, you know, how these people operate. In terms of kind of the playbook as I understand it. So, you know, we could, we'll likely see some tweak to yield curve control at some stage, and that'll be potentially widening the band or kind of targeting some of these shorter duration JGBs. Then at the same time, they'll probably, you know, figure out how eventually they'll exit yield curve control when that will happen it's not necessarily clear and then i think you know i read some research it'll be at least six months after that when they'll start hiking rates so you know that is kind of like your playbook and you know, you know that yield curve control tweak could coincide with the fed pausing the problem i have is that's an incredibly linear expectation and we've done this dance for years with the ecb like oh well you know, they'll stop QE, then they'll start hiking rates. And then a few months later, they've actually expanded QE because they've got the jitters over something. So I, th yeah, I think, you know, the BOJ's, you know, ability to kind of see see the job out is even kind of less than you see from like someone like the ECB. I think a lot has to go right for that playbook to be carried out. And I think it's something which will kind of take place over a number of years, not necessarily over the coming meetings or months. I think, you know, if the BOJ gets kind of a whiff that inflation, even if it is accompanied by wage gains, is going to come in on the soft side or, you know, there's some sort of banking turmoil, I think, you know, they'll happily just push this back because that's the psyche over in Japan with their monetary policy. You know, their demographics are very different to the Western world. They've got an aging population. They've struggled with inflation for years. So, yeah, you know, I mean, I will not be waking up at 4 a.m. to see it either, Michael, and I don't think I will for the foreseeable either. No, I think that's I think that's probably pretty wise. As as you say, the playbook, a lot has to go right. And it's also a different playbook to the one that we're sort of quote unquote used to in, in the Western world, given those demographic issues and challenges that they face. Um, Ryan, you mentioned the yen earlier. Why don't you get your teeth into this one a little bit? Ooh. Um so just quickly to push on with what Adam mentioned, my good friend Adam, my dear friend, my brother from another. Wait, um, we're friends. What, what does that mean? Oh, <laughs> minus a point, minus a point. <laughs> um, but um, what was that? Um, 
yes, um, what Adam said is something that we have spoke about on previous shows, which if you haven't seen them, go back and check them out. Blah, blah, blah. See how wrong we were. Um, it's time for the enemy forward guidance, right? It's time, nothing actually harder than time. So the longer that, you know, people are planning for this perfect scenario of events to happen, for this to happen, this, um, the longer that time is, the more chances are that something goes wrong. So Adam's nailed it on that point. So, yeah, so I completely agree with him on this. Um, in terms of what to expect, no one's expecting any move. Uh, something that I probably think is worth talking about is the fact that um, it was earlier on today, in fact, that the uh, the famous uh, Wanatabi, uh, however you want to pronounce his name, um, the uh, ex BOJ uh, currency diplomat said that, in his opinion, nothing will ha be happening on Friday. And he doesn't believe we'll see any, well, he doesn't really think we'll see anything for the rest of the year either. And that's because of the weakening economy. Um, Ueda himself, uh, I don't know if it was the, uh, earlier on this week or possibly late last, was it Monday? Yet yeah, said that, um, you know, the cost push inflation will subside in the near term uh, coming up. And, this, you know, bear in mind, we've just, you know, okay, inflation's the highest in, what, 40 years in Japan? Mm. But it's still fuck all. You know what I mean? It's like, <laughs> you know, the big, big deal. It's a great headline. Um, yeah, so by yeah, it's not going to be staying above their target two percent for long. Um, raw materials, imported raw material prices have likely peaked. His words, not mine. Um, yeah, so yeah, I don't, I can't see why anyone's getting excited about anything. Um, what would, what you know, what would you need to for things to go wrong? Um, you know, I well personally, I can't legitimately, genuinely cannot see anything that's going to spark the BOG into uh, BOJ into life, which is hilarious considering the macro tourists and whatever when Ueda was um voted in or when it came to part was saying oh yo he's a you know different breed the reason he's coming is to shake things up it just shows you that it's, it's different they're voting like research from like 2001 and it's like that's oh, 22 yeah, years yeah. <laughs> it's, like, it's like god you know you asked me a question this morning and it's gonna be different to what it is later on you know it depends how many beers i've had you know this is not kind of dwell on the fact that what happened you know that is my pet hate as soon as the new central bank is appointed let's oh, dig out something they said like yeah. it means they will yeah. hike next month like, honestly i guess so yeah. and, and it's always the same people as well <laughs> yeah. Like, um yeah i think you know what have we got we've got uh reuters are currently polling 90 percent um are saying no change today that's uh, like uh next in the next meeting oh. Um, there's a good chance that 10% are going against that are saying something different so that they get time in the press and the newspapers oh, like or not and I think a lot of people don't, don't realise this a lot of analysts and stuff you know, they are paid to say stuff they are paid to say stuff regularly that gets their bank or whatever in the papers get them you know get sound bites and stuff they don't have to be right or wrong right there's no, you know it's, as long as they're t kind of on top of it that's all that matters. You know, There's Nomori a certain Japanese bank who are absolutely criminal for that. Yeah, it's exactly. Oh, Nomura. Nomura. And also, okay, it's, I'm name them, there we go. Well, it's the Nomura. It's the Nomura. It's Nomura. Um, <laughs> who've just had a shocker with their profits as well, right? Um, not, you know, if you're listening and you're from Nomura, yeah, I love you lots. Always, I'll, you know, if you want to send me some money after days. But um, yeah, so it's it's a hundred percent that they're not going to change rates. I'm going to I'm going to go and say I will get a tattoo saying BOJ on my wrist if that's if that happens. There you go. Quote I am me. very glad you said wrist. Um, how? Yeah, <laughs> tell me about it. Yeah. it fit. Really. Um, but this. So also, these same economists are saying a forty percent chance of a uh, interest rate change in June. I don't even buy that. I just, I just do not see what's going to happen. Um, yeah, I think the only thing that we have got going for us is I believe on one of the first shows that we did, I said that when the Japanese yen um, currency index is available to trade on Pepstone, code is uh, JPYX, um, <laughs> was trading 860. It's I said you got to sell that with everything. It's now trading 830. So oh, yeah. There you go. You can have a bonus point for that. And I, I think Yay! I can... I can redeem a point myself because I actually know that that exists now. Um, <laughs> oh, yeah. Arno, do you reckon there's any risk at all surrounding this or, 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 or yen upside more broadly? Or is this just a complete snooze fest and the yen's actually going to be driven by more external factors? I think both these guys are wrong. They're going to hike rates on Friday. <laughs> What? No, I'm just kidding. Of course, I'm not kidding. Come on. But I just need to bring in some excitement. No, look, everybody knows they're not going to do anything. Uh, what's oh. interesting is I, I saw a couple of guys getting excited about the uh, one month risk reversals. <laughs> you have to hedge, right? If you've got a vested interest 
you have to hedge for in case something happens like we saw last time around. So that's the only reason why one month risk exactly reversal. Before, right? It's, yeah. hedge, it's insurance. Yeah, oh. they, have to, they have to buy insurance. So it's not like everybody's saying, ooh, this means they think they're going to do something. No, it's because they got caught with their uh, pants down back on December when they did move yield curve control and the yen absolutely ripped. They need to protect themselves. So yeah. the fact that risk reversals are pushing lower, we shouldn't read into that, that, hey, this is a market that thinks they're going to move. They have to protect themselves. So that's that's just how it works. You don't want to be the guy that don't protect and then you get tapped on the shoulder and say, <laughs> hey, listen, we had a BOJ meeting. Why didn't you protect the downside? So Or upside in that case for the yen. So that's something important to keep in mind. And you know, just I think Ueda himself closed the deal or sealed the deal for Friday. Uh, with his speech that that Ryan mentioned on Monday, right? He, he was very clear saying, listen, we need to see a much stronger trend in inflation than the one that we've seen. And the thing about inflation, right, is that, yes, we are at 40-year highs right now, but they, he he, he told us, or they, they've been saying that they think inflation is going to drift back down. And so far, so far, they've been right, right? We were at four spot 2% on national core CPI, uh, what is a month ago? We're now down to three spot one. So we had a full percentage point drop. So they're going to look at that and say, inflation has peaked. For now, we're right. It's going to drift lower. The only thing that's going to change their mind from year on out is going to be inflation. That's the only thing that we need to watch. And not only inflation, he said something very interesting, which I think uh, you know we can latch on to, is he was very clear on what needs to happen for them to adjust anything. It's not necessarily where inflation is, but where their own projections of forecast see inflation going, right? So the danger for the market here is that even if inflation sees a little bit of a tick up, if they if their own forecast don't see themselves or see inflation going higher, they're not going to do anything. They're just going to yeah. sit on their hands. And I think what Adam said, which is absolutely, th that for me is the biggest uh, risk for, for yen longs right now, is everybody assumes that they're going to they're gonna normalize later in the year. But if some of those expectations for the U.S. economy slowing actually pans out, if the H2 is this bloodbath and growth slows in the U.S. and the Fed pauses and eventually looks to, to hike uh, or to, to cut rates, do we really think the BOJ in that environment will suddenly start normalizing policy? I just I don't see that happening. So I think the, the clear risk here for the markets is that they got super excited at the start of the year. They bought the yen with everything inside them, uh, and, and some are still riding that wave. No, but they're going to normalize. They're going to normalize. They're going to normalize. The risk here is that, hey, they don't normalize, and you uh, you know, you know, get caught with your, uh, with your pants down as well. So the, I don't think there's any expectations for Friday. What we're seeing in the markets is, is people that has to hedge their risk. That's not them thinking something is going to happen. And you know what? If he comes out and he does sound slightly more hawkish, that's going to move the yen, so you can trade that. If he comes out and he sounds very, very dovish, it's probably going to see the end pushing lower and you might be able to day trade that. But in terms of anything more than a scalp trade out of the event, I, you know what? It's not something they're going to wake up that early for. No. Just on, sorry, just on this point, whilst uh, so I just quickly double check whilst my good friend Arno was chatting um, in terms of exactly what he was talking about. So as in like uh, Forex sentiment and stuff, UBS put out a note uh, in the past couple of days saying they believe that Forex markets are incredible. Sorry, let me get back into the middle of the shot. Um, is incredibly uh, under position, which means if, if if the whole market is under position, it means insurance for that is going to be cheap because obviously, you know, so exactly what Arno said. Also, tie in with that, our good friend uh, Watanabe, um, the ex chief uh, Forex diplomat in um, in Japan, I believe he quoted as saying, if we do get a surprise, we could see dollar yen spike to 115. Uh, which would be a hell of a move, but you know it's something to bear in mind. That's where he sees it spiking. If we do see a surprise, not that we will, but there we go. Be aware. Indeed, I don't know the geezer's name, but I don't think it's that. What an is this <laughs> Japanese retail trading nonsense. No, it's, it's Hiroshi Watanabe. I thought you were going to get mixed up with wasabi then, Mike, and I was about to have my head in my hands. Green stuff at sushi. <laughs> right. Uh, before we murder the pronunciation, that's easy for me to say, of any other Japanese names, let's move on to the last round.
I'm slightly worried that Ryan hasn't had the rant to, that I know he's going to have at some point. So we're going to go to him first here. We want to talk about growth. Uh, some interesting PMI numbers out last week. Um, I think in Europe and in the UK, the divergence between the services sector and the manufacturing sector was quite notable. We had um, the manufacturing indices coming in at, at lowest level since uh, 2020, and then the services sector in both the UK and Europe expanding at its fastest pace in a year. Um, and then we had some, some really, really solid numbers out of the US with both the services and manufacturing sectors expanding at, at quite a healthy clip. Um, Ryan, what I really want to get into with you, first of all, but before we get to the rest of the panel is, do you think that this resilience, particularly in the services sector, is something that can last? Or do you think this is just kind of the last knockings of the economic upswing before the effects or the lagged effects of policy tightening really start to bite? Um, well, firstly, I just want to go back and say, uh, according to Reuters, I'm correct. It's Hiroshi Watanabe. Um, well, anyway, I defer to Reuters greater. Okay. Knowledge. Um, so in terms of growth, right? Um, services. Um, I people are going to hate this, and it's you know, add it to the list of my unpopular opinions. Um, I believe you know things are looking alright. I don't think it's going to kind of. I don't. I don't see this lag effects coming through. It's going to hinder. Um, growth so much also you know in terms of services and whatever I think it's quite interesting to see the divergence between manufacturing and services UK and Eurozone um, but in terms of where the US which is obviously where the most market is um, it's you know been a convergence um, which is quite interesting if you're boring like me um, <laughs> obviously I'm not a massive fan of PMI's full stop um, you know it's for whatever reasons um, I think it's quite interesting to note that Goldman Sachs themselves uh, earlier this week or might have been late last week um, said that they believe the way equity markets are pricing, they're, they're downgrading its price. The type, equity markets are downgrading their own pricing of domestic growth in the US. Um, so basically that's a glorified way of saying cyclicals underperforming defensives. Um, the recent stress in the banking sector Obviously, you know, the second round or round two of, um, like, yes, I think there is a difference between second round and round two of banking mm -hmm. sector of stresses. Um, and the mixed economic data is clouding a lot of outlooks, um, and rightly so, perhaps. Um, you know, rising jobless claims um, and a weak ISM uh, for uh, ISM print last month, um, potentially saying that we're, we're slowing in the US. Um, again, day, one round of data doesn't make a summer kind of vibes. Um, personally, I'm I'm just not buying this whole massive slowdown that people are predicting for H2. Uh, you know, global context. I think okay, you got the geopolitical risks that are always kind of sh in the in the shadows. The Russia Ukraine war isn't getting worse if you can put it mild, if you can phrase it like that. You know, you look for your upsides and stuff. Um, I do think. The path of least resistance is still higher for markets and possibly probably growth. You know, we've, we've China are coming out still of the COVID kind of lock in, locking in of the economy. Um, yeah, there's a lot going on that could spur forward. I think you're you're needing a lot to go wrong for us to fall back into recessions or whatever. And, and speaking of recessions and this, OK, maybe you, this will be my second rant of the, uh, the show. No <laughs> one gives a flying about what the definition of a recession is, when it's met and when it's not. No one even cares when a bull market definition or bear market definition is, is met. Well, when I say nobody, real traders, you know, and I'm fortunate enough to be in some circles, you know, I know some very, very lumpy traders, hedge funds, um, you, know, so, uh, you know, some huge brokers and stuff, just because I'm an old git and I look 12, but that's you know, private <laughs> life. Um, but no, none of those give a flying if we are technically in a bear market or a bull market or technically in a recession, get away from those definitions. It's not like overnight when those criteria met markets trade differently. They just don't. So if you're looking for, you know, if you want to trade gray jeans, yeah, fine. But don't, if you're a retail trader, a new retail trader, and I'm guessing you probably are if you're watching this and, you know, all the luck to you. Stay away from thinking, oh, we're in a bear market. I must be looking to sell. Yeah. Or I'm in a bull market. I must be looking to buy. You will end up in the poorhouse if you keep doing that. Stick away. Stay away from idiots that keep pumping that crap. Um, yeah, I guess that's my run. I... <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. No, exactly. Recession. 
by the time it's been defined, that is, right. you know, it's very yeah. much after the fact. You don't yeah. just hear yeah, like, exactly. oh, we're in a recession today. Exactly. It's, like, it's like you get the council of, you know, whatever they're called. And then at some point they declare right. it and then no one agrees on it anyway. <laughs> Well, this yeah. is it. It's, it's be, the, the, the definition of recession is defined by backwards-looking data being crap for a long time. So I'll give you a clue. You've already been in the shit for a pretty long time before it's classified as a recession. <laughs> no, you're <laughs> anyway, right. Right. No, that, right. That is definitely my rant. Over, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're absolutely right. Um, Adam, wh- which way do you think risks tilt in terms of the growth outlook at this point? So, you know, if you, you kind of go back to this uh, divergence between the services and manufacturing you picked up on, so I kind of look more at UK and Eurozone. I think, you know, the manufacturing that's been contracting. So, you know, we did have some optimism as the supply chain effects dissipated. And yes, we've still kind of got a backlog of orders, but critically, the new orders components have been pretty soft. So that's kind of like more indicative of slowing demand. And I don't think that's necessarily something which is obviously going to improve at the margin. For the services element, yes, it has been holding up. And for me, this is actually a little bit more of a head scratcher. You know, one thing that had underpinned services last year was kind of, you know, the unwind, you know, pent up demand from COVID, et cetera, et cetera. I think, you know, I don't think that's really rational that you can apply now. And when you kind of look at the level of services inflation and the squeezes on household income, I'm surprised it's holding up the way that it is. And I think, you know, that could be a potential shoe to drop. Um, so, you know, I think the growth, I think the growth outlook will, you know, deteriorate. And also this, you know, this concept of tight, uh, tightening the pipeline. We've seen a couple of officials say this. And to me, that kind of, you know, typically the rule of thumb is 18 months. It kind of takes for a rate hike to have effect. This cycle, people are saying more, it'll be kind of 12 months. So, you know, if you kind of look at the tightening we've already kind of seen just this year and, you know, in Q4 last year. There is still a lot of that to kind of work its way through to the market. And I I also think that, you know, people, if you take the Bank of England, it's a great example. So their inflation is five times the target at the moment. And everyone's, you know, losing their minds over it, rightfully so. But policymakers, they set policy for the medium term. So the fact that it's 10% today, you know, it, it shouldn't really be the thing that's kind of dictating their decisions. But the problem is, is, you know, there's a credibility element to this, where if they're not seen to be kind of cracking down on this, then people are going to lose confidence in them. So I think we could be in a world where policymakers think, God, we're actually going to have to keep our foot on the pedal more than we otherwise would if this was purely just an issue of us cracking down on inflation. And so, you know, UK is a great example. We have a lot of variable mortgages. So, you know, rates start going higher that will squeeze the customer, the consumer. And that's something which is, I think will play out throughout the year. But in terms of growth, though, yes, obviously that will hamper growth. I don't think we're going to get this kind of full-blown recession. And the main reason why I think that is the labour market. And I think because the labour market is a lot more resilient this time around than you typically would get in a growth slowdown. So you take the UK, for example, a lot of people left the labour force um during covid due to ill health and then we also saw you know visa requirements a little bit more difficult post brexit so what we've kind of seen in the uk for a while is employers are a lot more reticent to let people go at the drop of a hat so i think what you'll kind of see is you know typically in a bad recession you see spikes in unemployment rates you know and obviously that the effects of that kind of exacerbates the flat the you know the fans of any recession i don't think we necessarily get that at this, you know, in this kind of recession, I think we see slightly negative or anemic growth of a little bit for a little bit, whilst the labour market, all things equal, kind of digs in. I think you know, in terms of kind of like what's the, po- I think the biggest fear is what is you know the positive growth story when we get out of this, and I think that's the that's the more difficult thing. We've got a, you know potentially an era here of deglobalisation, a more fractured geopolitical backdrop. You know, policymakers have spent a lot of ammunition already. You know, what is it that's going to get us necessarily out of this rut? And if inflation doesn't come down, you know, then that, you know, that's the thing that's really going to be the main story here, because what what a central bank is going to do. No, I completely agree. I think it's actually tough to argue with with any of that. Arno, let's um, go to you for the last word on the show. You're probably one of the most pessimistic panellists we have on around the growth outlook. Are you still Mr. Doom and Gloom over there? I saw um, 
who was oh it was Jeremy Grantham was saying yesterday that the S and P is going to fall fifty percent and all our houses will be worthless. Are you uh, are you of that view or slightly more moderated? He lives in South Africa. It already is. I mean, you know, <laughs> you, you guys, you guys think it's tough over there. I mean, at least you've got power, right? I mean, you've got electricity. You don't see the you don't see the queue I had for my frappuccino earlier. <laughs> 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 no, so look, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say I think equities has fifty percent downside from here. What I do still think, though, is that growth will continue to slow. Whether that leads to like a, a huge, massive, you know, 08 recession, I'm not sure. But what I look at, in, and it's not the GDP, by the way, what we look at is the leading and coincident indicators. And all of them still show very anemic growth, still slowing show down, uh, a slowdown. Now, just quickly touching on the PMIs, like Ryan said, you know, when it comes to PMIs, I prefer the ISM over the, the S&P, or it's not S&P anymore. Who is it now? It's changed like... No, it is now. I think it's the European ones have changed. Yeah, they had a, there's a different name now. It's, it's not even S&P anymore. It's like, I don't know. Anyway, I think, I think that's know just the European about. ones. Okay. So S&P is not my favorite. And we've actually recently seen quite a few divergences between what the ISM has shown us and what the flash PMIs have shown us. Now, even though we had... The flash PMI, the manufacturing one on the US pushing up, we had the regional Fed data points coming in pretty bleak recently, right? We had the Philly Fed that printed a new cycle high. The Dallas Fed is close to, I think, the lows from last year. We had the Richmond Fed coming in lower as well. So the only thing that didn't print low was the Empire State. And that is normally considered as a more volatile one anyway. So compared to, I would rather, you know, believe something like the Philly Fed index over something like the Empire State. And that should mean that there is more downside risk to be had for at least the ISM manufacturing going into next week. Um, if that doesn't happen with the market, sure that it's going to slow down. That can obviously create some short-term opportunities for day traders out there. But again, you know, when it comes to how this relates back to the growth story, um, I don't think that I'm, 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 what we've seen from coincident and leading indicators, I'm pretty sure of that. The housing market has been slowing. We have been bouncing, but that's not uncommon going into a, a deeper slowdown to see some of those faster leading indicator data points actually bounce mid slowdown. So I think that's pretty normal. Some activity data has been resilient, but we've seen a, a huge, it's not the absolute level that you know we should be focused on when it comes to these data points, right? It's, it's the rate of change. It's where we were coming from and where we're going. And right now, those trends are all pretty much still negative when it comes to activity data. Retail sales has been declining. Delinquencies are picking up. Credit is drying up. We've got yield curve inversions. All of those things, I think, is there's a reason we call them leading, right? It's because they are, they're showing us what is going to happen to the rest of the broader economy. But where I think the big problem comes in right now, and I think Adam touched on this as well as Ryan, is that I don't think we need to focus on growth per se. I think the linchpin here is all the labor market. It comes back to the labor market because all of the leading indicators and coincident indicators can keep showing us slowdown for the next six months. If the labor market doesn't soften, then we're not going to see a deeper uh, uh, a slowdown. So my, my view on the data is that what we've seen from the data so far, leading coincident indicators, shows that the next step for the labor market is a deterioration. It's kept up much better this time around. And I know there's a lot of talk out there about why that could be. Maybe it's you know the, the change, the work from home. Maybe people are sitting on more than one job at a time. And that can explain why if you lose the one, it might not necessarily mean you stop spending because you might have another one in the, uh, you know, in the, uh, in the pocket. So I understand that there's been some changes with that. But if you just take a look at something like the Philly Fed, for example, normally when we've seen this type of slowdown in that indicator, normally it means that the next thing to happen is the unemployment rate should go up. And this is the case across the oh, board. No. Sorry, I'm going to have to stop you there because rather annoyingly, the fire alarm is going off in this building. I don't know whether you can hear that. Uh, yeah. So I need to go. Um, that does handily bring us to the end of the show anyway. Ryan, oh. your yellow hoodie is obviously lucky. Congratulations on the win. So um, to get revealed that Ryan just week. paid someone 20 quid to let the fire alarm off <laughs> in the building. Saved by the alarm. I don't, I don't know what you're on about. Um, I, don't, I have been playing with my lighter for most of the <laughs> <laughs> So I'm off, and uh, we will see you again next week. Thanks for watching. Goodbye uh, for now. Bye.